Welcome. Good to have you. Thank you. Sir. Um, you know, we just launched phase two of Project Play, Reimagining School Sports in America, which aims to identify models that help schools develop as many students as possible through sports. You know, the data show that most kids don't play school sports. Why is it important for schools to provide opportunities for all students? Well, Tom, I honestly believe um, sports is a whole person developmental tool. You need sports to grow. Um, to deprive any child of the positive life lessons that playing sports provides because of race, gender, or affordability is absolutely insane. Athlet athletics just builds character. I can say that from as a father, son, brother, friend. It's, it's a melting pot of kids that's trying to move in the right direction. So for that opportunity to be taken away from anyone, that does not bode well for our future. How does the coach bring out the voice of the kid as well? How do they create the communication so it's all not just one way and the coach saying, this, this is my way or the highway? Well, just appreciating who that kid is, taking the time out and, and watching him and learning him. It's a relationship. Ask them how the day is going. Ask them how school is going. How are they doing in the hallway? Paying attention to them when they do see them off the field. Let them know that they mean something to them. To me, that's what is so important about creating that dynamic between coach and player where you, that player understands that that coach has the last word, but that coach has to be open to hear what that kid is saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and know, know that kid's story. It's actually one of the, in our calls for coaches uh, package. It's, it's one of those calls. And, and know what the kid's facing, know what they're, they're up against in life. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I, I look back on that notion. I had a math teacher, Mr. Pendle, a white gentleman, older. He took the time. He took the time to make sure that I understood how important it was to work in that classroom and how important it was for me to do the, give that same effort out there on that field. But when I saw him in the hallway, I saw him in the lunchroom, he went out of his way to to touch me, to talk to me, make sure he watched who I was hanging out with. He, he, it, it became something um, um, within him. He didn't have to do that. I had a father. I had a, a two-parent household. I had super parental supervision. Um, but unfortunately, that time is a little bit different than now. I had friends who only had one parent, whether it was the grandparent, whether it's the aunt, whether it's the mother, whether it's the father. And it's tough. So as a coach, I implore these coaches to take that time. And I'm not asking that you have to become a father and you have to provide resources, but pay attention. Pay attention because that kid is trusting that, that coach to do more than just the X and O's. I mean, baseball takes a lot of land. Basketball, not so much, right? It's a, it's a more affordable game. It doesn't require as much upkeep. How much of, of getting you know, lower income kids or, uh, and, and, and kids from black communities into the game has to do with simply creating spaces that are nearby, not a half a county away, where they can play against other kids who are good. One thing that I do remember growing up was if you had a tennis ball and you had a wiffle ball bat, a wiffle ball, you didn't need a lot of space. If you had a stoop, you had a step, you had a wall, you had a piece of chalk, you had a rock, you can draw a strike zone. You can find a way to play baseball. Unfortunately, now you don't see those spray painted boxes on walls anymore. You don't see free access to fields. You see chain link fields. You understand that the growth, the, the profit that has been generated through youth and travel sports, the, the placations, they're putting a lot of money onto these fields and the maintenance of these fields is not for the public to go practice and just have fun on. It has to be remained to a certain level of standards. So they lock the gates. 
So even if I wanted to go out there and hit ground balls and churn up the infield, you're probably going to have to jump that fence and walk through the gate because they're protecting their investment. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how you have to pay 10 to 15 or 25 dollars to just go out there and play or you're being pushed off the field because you don't have any parental supervision or you didn't sign up with on the website to say this is my block of time. We're reducing the kids for just going out there and organically playing. I went by a tennis court the other day. You got a net, you got a square and you got a and you have space tennis only. What? That was one of the best places to play a wiffle ball game. You had a fence. You just had to jog it a little bit, but you had a net. Ground balls into the net was an out. Balls over the fence was a home run. But that was the game, but that's not happening now. Unfortunately, to your point, parks and recs, we need them. We need parks and recs to understand that there is a need to have kids out there, have more free clinics, provide equipment, provide equipment, provide gloves. Because when we went out there, I didn't have a personalized helmet. I didn't have a personalized bat. I, the coach walked in with the duffel bag and had dumped it out there and free for all. Oh, hey, hey, And you left the bat there or you changed the helmet. I understand the COVID has changed a lot. But the affordability and how we're predicting or dictating how we should go out there and just play has changed. And so I just want these kids to understand. I want the parents to understand. I want the coaches to understand. This game is the hardest game to play. You don't have to be the most athletic to play this game, but it's the hardest game to play. So repetition is key. So the more chances we have a chance to get these kids out there in a free or low cost environment, and that's gonna take effort, that's gonna take time, that's gonna take patience, it's going to be better served for the game. So uh, first of all, welcome to the uh, the Project Play 2024 group. Uh, you're the first uh, players union that's uh, been part of our deliberations. Real excited to kind of dig in with you and uh, the other groups uh, sitting around that table to figure out how to get and keep kids playing sports in this country. What did, would you say the role of, uh, of the Players Association is? When you look at your assets, you've got your players, you've got your experience, you've got your you got some programs in place right now. But what's the role of the union? Well, Tom, first and foremost, I do want to give a shout out to, the, uh, to, the, to, to my staff, my colleagues, led by Tony Clark, who, as you know, has been widely broadcast that he's a former ball player, mm -hmm. former all-star. Um, he feels as though that the Major League Baseball Players Association's voice, the players' voices is needed in this in these efforts. We're watching a lot of movement. We're watching what MLB is doing. We're watching what what Aspen and and, 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 and and countless other initiatives around the country that's trying to help move that needle for the better. Because we see that there's something wrong here. So Tony feels as though that, you know what, guys, we can talk about it all we want in this room amongst ourselves and we have the solutions. Now we have to, under, we're a union, there's strength in numbers, there's power in unity.